The book of Genesis captures the narrative of how God created not only the heavens and the earth, but human beings in God's image. As you hear the scripture read aloud, listen for the ways in which the creation story exemplifies beauty, both beauty in the created and beauty in the process of creating. The first scripture reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, found on page 1 in your pew Bibles in the Old Testament. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Holy words for God's people. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture reading is in the New Testament in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Holy holy words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Good morning again, everybody. So glad to worship with you. Um, it's been a long time since I've had gotten the chance to worship in the same place for two weeks, and I can't tell you um, how wonderful it is to see your faces. I think Pastor Sarah shared an excellent illustration because we do look out at one another, don't we? And we don't see a mirror when we see one another. There is something beautiful about what we see. Um, today we start this new sermon series called Beautiful Things. I, I want to name that I'm very grateful that Joanne is uh, willing to share her gifts in this way as she creates in each of our services how she feels the spirit leading. And I want to start by sharing with you a story about my first time I really began to understand um, what beauty is and how to explain beautiful. Um, I'm a father, and I have three little girls. They're six, six, and seven right now. And I love them, and they change everything for me. It's not a new lens, but it's a new filter in photography terms on how I see the world through their eyes. And a few years ago, um, somebody was really, really kind and gave my three little girls three dolls. And I thought, oh, this is awesome. And so I was downstairs, and I saw them playing together with these dolls. Then I started to look at these dolls a bit more, and I started to really look at these dolls. And by the way, this story isn't about gifts we should or shouldn't give to our kids or things like that. We'll get past that, please. But um, these dolls had little skirts that were about as high as right here, um, and little V-necks that were cut down to right about here. And these little dolls were little girls, but had a lot of makeup on. Um, and just were, um, didn't exactly sit well with me. And um, being a wise man, I ran up to where my wife was because she was working on a project. I said, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And she said, just tell them it's it's not the right toy for them and explain to them why that's important. So I went down the stairs. And my girls, I don't know, they're probably three or four at this time. I said, these toys are no good. Give them to me. Take the dolls, move them away, put them on a high shelf where they couldn't reach them. 
Um, and as I was moving them, sometimes I get so focused, I can't hear everything, but in a few moments, I could hear what they were doing, which was crying and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and they were really upset. And then they said, why? Why did you take our toys away? We loved these dolls. They had bonded with these. I said, well, let me explain to you this understanding of Genesis 1 and what it means to be made in the image of God. So I sat down with them and I started talking to them about the Latin and the Hebrew and how God created us in God's image and this is not God's image and don't you understand that you're, you're way more beautiful than this and I'm talking and talking and you know sometimes I do talk a little fast. At that moment I was talking really fast and I was so into what I was trying to say because I wanted to get the information to them that I, clearly it wasn't hitting home with them and they just kept crying. So my wife comes down because she could hear from upstairs what was going on. And with permission, I'm sharing this, by the way. And she walks down with this full-length mirror. Doesn't look at me. She's clearly not mad at me, but she's not looking at me. She puts the mirror right on the floor where the girls are crying. And she has each girl walk up to the mirror, and she says, tell me what you see when you look in the mirror. And they begin to describe what they saw. Tell me, what do you love about yourself? And they begin to describe. I like my hair. It's curly. I like my skin. I like the way I smile. Tell me what you like about your sister. And this process started going on and on about what they loved. And then she took the dolls out from the shelf and she put it down and she put the, the dolls next to my, each of my daughters and said, how do you look like these daughters? How do you look different than these daughters? And she began to explain to them what beauty is and what does it mean to understand our beauty not in the ways that um, we're supposed to feel like we're supposed to look, but how do we lift each other up just as we are. And I'm watching this moment, and she did it without even practicing, without even trying. She didn't use any big theological words. She just explained to them what was beautiful by letting them talk about what they saw in the mirror. And at that moment, I had been saving some money for quite a few months for a toy that was electronic, of course, and I was so excited. And I pulled out all of my cash and said, just take my money. Buy whatever dolls you want. And we went to a store and we bought some dolls that looked a lot more like them and that they thought were beautiful. And now these are the only dolls my girls have. And they're the only dolls they keep. And we, I remember that story because um, they were beginning to talk about something that I had no concept of how to explain. So I start this sermon series with a confession. Me talking to you about beauty is actually not going to work. Because in my best of days, I'm going to rely on my head and forget to connect it to my heart. Or on some other days, I'll talk about my heart but forget to talk about and honor what you bring to this table as well. So instead, I want to offer an idea of what maybe how we can understand beauty. Um, as I tried to research what beauty is, I began to understand that beauty is different across different cultures and certainly across different time eras. What we considered beauty in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s is very different than we understand beauty today. But we understand beauty here in the Bothell, Kenmore area, wherever your home community is, is very different than the island of Samoa or Tonga or in the Philippines or Cambodia or in Japan. Beauty is truly different in many different ways based off of what our culture believes and, um, and defines that. Actually, I want to say this. I believe that beauty is a social construct. That's kind of like a timer that winds down. In our best of days, we explain beauty as something that is finite, but we all know that beauty is finite because eventually things will begin to change. I've tried to describe myself, and I thought, what, what would happen if I tried to describe the things that are beautiful about me to you? Well, I'd say it's easy. I'm six foot three, my face is like the Adonis, I've got no gut, and I can run the mile in three and a half minutes. So no. But you know, even when I was writing the sermon trying to talk about that, I realized I started with all the things that I'm not rather than begin to share with you with the ways God has made me uniquely me. I think in some ways we're also tempted to conform or to fit in rather than stick out for the ways that we are uniquely each one of us. Every Sunday I try to ask you a question. This is why Pastor Sarah told you about this tearaway sheet where you can fill in the answer. Um, last week, I asked you to explain or define what beauty is. And your, response, your uh, responses, again, were overwhelming. They were vulnerable. They are candid. Some of them brought me to tears. One in particular I want to lift up to you, and we have it on the screen here, right, April? This is what one person wrote. Beauty is that which is full of love, that which inspires love, that which demonstrates love, that which reminds us to be loving and to remember that we are love. Beauty reminds us of God's immense love for all of creation. In these next three weeks, starting today, 
We are each one of us going to have the opportunity to create something very beautiful together. And this really only work if all of us participate. So in this series, that's why we want you to be able to draw pictures or put words together on that little white piece of paper you have in your insert, because we're going to add that to the mosaic of what we create together. That's why we ask a local artist to come in and to create based off the spirit, because we don't want to just lift up beauty as what one person conveys to many, but what many do in sharing with one another how we understand what it means to be made as beautiful and in the image of God. And we know that we're beautiful And we believe it, and we want you to believe it, because each one of us are made in the image of God. And as Pastor Sarah said so perfectly, there are a lot of images of God in church this morning. There'll be even more when you leave church this morning and go to the places where you eat, or go play, or enjoy the sun, or watch the Seahawks play. I wonder this. I wonder if conformity is not the beauty that we should seek, meaning that we should all look the same, But rather, I wonder if we should seek harmony that allows space for diversity. I told you a few years back that um, in churches across America, one of the most diverse places on a Sunday morning is actually not in local churches. But where is it most likely? Across America, it's usually in the grocery stores. Over the years since we've been worshiping together, we're getting better about allowing for diversity to be here and allowing for one another to be in each other's presence. If we take a look at Genesis chapter 1, if you've got your Bibles, please pull them out. If not, it's the little blue book that's in front of you there. And please turn to Genesis chapter 1. If you don't know where the book of Genesis is, open up to the very front of your Bible. It's the very first book, to the very first chapter, to the very first few verses. And in Genesis 1, we see one of the earlier blessings we can find from God, when God, after creating, says to be fruitful and to multiply. In these creation stories, we can read about how God had created humanity, all genders, in the image of God. And in this um, moment, this is what I was trying to explain to my little girls, we're made in what's called the image of God, the imago Dei. Um, That's a funny word that doesn't translate really well into English, but one of the ways that Barbara Brown Taylor, who wrote a great book, which we talked about years ago, is called An Altar in the World, It's, it's another way of saying each of us are given the imprint of God in creation. And with the imprint of God in creation, we have the ability to affirm or destroy that imprint in one another through our actions or our inactions. I love the way she talks about that. Again, the book is called An Altar in the World by Barbara Brown Taylor. Now, our music director, Jeremy, Matthias, and I, we get together and we talk about the music that's coming up. A few years years ago, we had the exact same service at all three services. So it was rather easy. We played what? Seven to ten songs a Sunday, would you say? Less. Less. Three to five. A handful of songs. Now, how many do you think we do we play a Sunday now, Jeremy? Different songs. Fifteen? Cool. So we've more than doubled, maybe even tripled, depending on which Sunday, how many songs we play. So Jeremy and I get together, and we look at each sermon, especially the one coming up, and he shares why he picks each song and the diversity that it allows and how it speaks to the theology because the worship service isn't just about the preaching moment, it's about the experience we have together. And he shared something so profound as we were preparing for this Sunday. He said that when he was looking for um, this uh, theology of beauty and how we can sustain the sermon series, not just by art and not just by the spoken word, but by the sung word together, he said that far too often what he found was songs about our sinfulness and songs about our brokenness. Even in the history of Methodism and greater Christianity, it's so much easier for us to find what is wrong with us rather than see what is beautiful about who we are. Let's take a closer look at our scripture this morning. If you'll turn to your Bibles, let's, we're going to kind of walk through each of the creation days. And they're divided up pretty simply and pretty easily. The Bibles you have in front of you, if you're using the ones in the pews, is called the New Revised Standard Version. And it's divided up like this. On the first day of creation, it's verses 1 through 5. And in that day, God speaks into creation, earth and everything beyond earth. And God divided light and day darkness and night. And you can see it as written here. Then God said in verse 3 of chapter 1, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. Verses 6 through 8 talks about in the translation of the NRSV that God created something called the dome, 
We understand that as our atmosphere, the sky, what separates top from bottom as we understand it. And then day three in verses nine through 13, God creates dry land and seas and God pronounces a blessing and calls it also good in that day. Then God spoke into creation, living things in the air and in water, and God saw and spoke into it how good it was. The word good in Hebrew is tov. And, and kind of one interpreter's understanding of the word tov in this is it's not tov static, it's tov organic. It's this idea of it's good and it's not yet done yet, but there's a good seed, there's a good essence to the start of this when God is calling it good. By the time we get to verses 20 through 23, we find day five. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created great sea monsters and every living creature, and it goes on talking about how God started to create more life in this time. And again, at the end of the day, God declares it to be tov, to be good, the start of that which is good. And in day six, that's where we get to what was read to us by our scripture leader this morning, Alan. And in day six, we find verses 24 to 31. God creates creatures on dry land and everything that has not been made yet. And of course, God creates humanity in God's image. And in that moment, there's something really cool that happens. In verse 26, it reads like this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And God continues to create upon God's creation and in verse 31, it reads this. God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was tov miod, or the word is very good. In most translations, it says very good. In the Common English Bible, which is a new translation that's come out, and there's a lot of good in that translation, I think, they use the word supremely good. I, I, I like the distinction here, because in the first other days of creation from day one, when God creates divisions and provides all this diversity between um, night and day and sea and land and sky and water and all these things, God calls it just good, the beginning of good. But it's not actually tov meod, very good, until all of creation is together and beginning to work in harmony with one another. That's why we chose John 3.16. You probably know John 3.16, right? You've heard that before? You know what was weird? When I was preparing for this series a little while ago, I was thinking about this, and in my mind, I had always translated it this way, for God so loved humanity that God, and it keeps going, right? But that's not actually how the verse goes, is it? How's it go? For God so loved what? Yeah. For God so loved the world. For God so loved all of creation. I don't know why, but in my mind somewhere, I began to believe that John 3.16 was about God loving me, humanity, all genders, but I forgot that actually this is a great pointer back to the creation story of when God so loved all of creation and all that it is. So let's unpack this just a little bit more. When creation worked in harmony with one another as God intended, it was supremely good. There were still differences because the sky is not the land, and the land are not the crawling things upon the earth, and the crawling things upon the earth are not the creatures of the sea, and the creatures of the sea is not humanity. And humanity is not even exactly the same as one another. Actually, all of creation has divisions, has categories, has divisions, and is completely diverse. And when God saw the diversity and the division within all that God he created, it was that moment when God spoke it to be told me old, to be very good. Do you kind of get where I'm going with this? Maybe, Jeremy, can you help me with this for a second, please? Um, will you help our choir, lead our choir in singing a note together, please? What note did they sing? It's a D. A D, thank you. Was that just for me, for DJ? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have known the note. So they all sang one note. Now, my understanding, because you know how gifted I am in music, not, is you can also harmonize. How would you explain what harmony is, essentially? Adding texture. Adding texture, okay. Would you please help our choir harmonize?
Thank you very much. There's nothing wrong with the entire choir singing the same note, that D. It's a good note. It's the same sound. But I don't know, but for my ear, it's so much more pleasant. It's so much more full. It has so much more texture when the choir gets to sing the parts that make you uniquely you, the different notes that harmonize together and work in sync with one another. I wonder if that's what God was pointing to when God said it wasn't just good anymore as individuals, but it became very good when all of creation was in harmony with one another. There's something really beautiful about that because I think we can fall into the temptation of destroying the image of God in one another with our actions, our inactions, when we say, you must sing the same note as me. There was a president who was recently interviewed, a former president, uh, about what he thinks about what's happening in our world today. And he brought up some really great points and talked about how we live in a day and age when we can um, curate our content in such a way where I can read what only I want to read. Now, he said there's some positives to this. He said um, he thinks that we're moving better and having better conversations about homophobia, about um, ageism, about sexism, and talking about gender equality. He thinks we're beginning to move towards um, better ways of seeing and hearing one another. But he said the problem is there is one form of bigotry that we can't seem to let go of, and it seems to be rising to the, sur to the surface. He said we don't want to have to be around anyone who disagrees with us. And that form of bigotry is the one that seems to be winning the most. I translate that in my head in the context of scripture, in the context of beautiful things, as saying we want everyone to sing the same note, to at least dress like me. I admit, you know, I, I cleaned my hair because I didn't, I didn't want you to think that maybe your pastor doesn't know how to comb his hair, but I didn't shave and I thought, are people going to think that maybe I didn't sleep very well last night? Because maybe if I look exactly as you think I should look, or I act exactly as you think I should act, or more importantly, I somehow make you think that you need to look and act and think, because all Christians look and act and think and vote and talk exactly the same way. Thank you for laughing. Because <laughs> if we all sang the same note, it only works for so long, but it lacks the richness and the texture of what we could possibly be together. Creation was tov me'od when there was harmony with division, celebrating diversity. Creation was beautiful when we understood that harmony doesn't always equal divisiveness, that division doesn't mean that we have to separate from one another. Rather, Church is one of the few places where we can get together and actively disagree with one another. Actively say, this is what I believe, what do you believe? Let's talk this through together. And maybe, maybe not, we'll convince each other, but absolutely, could this be a safe place where we take what we are and lay it at one another and find a way to harmonize because we don't have to sing the same note? Our sinfulness tempts us to believe that divisions almost always equal divisiveness rather than celebrating what makes you uniquely you and what makes me uniquely me. Because friends, you are beautiful exactly as you are and don't let anyone ever tell you something different. For you are the living image of God. My prayer this week is for us to begin to focus on what it means to celebrate the beauty in one another the diversity in one another, the divisions that we have, without fear of learning or growing, without fear of finding out that we're wrong, but to remember that there was once a day when God looked at creation and all of its divisions and all of its diversity and said, this is tov me'od, this is very, very good. For God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son. God didn't just love man or woman, or for us to sing or act a certain way. God loved us as we are in harmony of what we can become. May the kingdom of God come today. May we seek that today. May your life, may your actions, and may your inactions speak to affirming the image of God in one another. And as we do, may you be blessed. Pray with me, please. Holy and gracious God, will you forgive me for the times when I see others do things that don't make me comfortable and I focus, God, on the ways that they're doing things rather than what they're doing, rather than what I can learn from them. Will you forgive me for the times when I see somebody who is different than me, 
somebody who thinks different than me, and I see that as a threat rather than an opportunity to celebrate what makes that person uniquely them and what makes me uniquely me. Will you forgive us as a community of faith for the times that we have been silent when you ask us to speak up? Will you forgive us as a community of faith when we speak up, when you ask us to sit at your feet and listen and learn? Will you give us the wisdom to know the difference? Will you, oh God, create in us a clean heart? Will you help us to seek harmony and not a single note? Will you help us to celebrate texture? We help us to celebrate all that you are. For you are the living God. You are God who loves all of the world and all of creation. May our world, may this kingdom that you bring, O oh God, be once again very good. In your son's name, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen.